Hello. Hi, is this Chris? Yes, it is. All right, well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited and honored to welcome our featured guest for this evening. She is an author and a radio show podcast host and the daughter of comedy legend Lou Costello. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Chris Costello to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Chris. Hello there. How are you? We're well. I have to tell you that before the interview, I had to pull Terry, the the host here, off of watching cartoons that featured likenesses of <laughs> Abbott and Costello. I'm like, we have to do the interview. Will you please stop? <laughs> that is great. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I want you to know I'm I'm very Twitter pated, as a cartoon would say, because your father meant so much to me, and I'm so happy you're on the show. Oh, thank you very much. That is so sweet of you. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I was actually watching some old interviews of you last night on YouTube, and it was really funny. Some of the things that people have said when they, they were shocked or didn't believe that you were Lou's daughter, and I guess you got things like thinking that you were Elvis Costello's daughter. I'm <laughs> <laughs> down to people have actually said you're the daughter of Abbott and Costello, as if you were the daughter of I both. <laughs> Well, you know, I've heard it all, heard it yeah. all, and, you know, but uh, God bless them, you know, I mean, it, it's that's sort of a second book in the right. making, um, but, uh, you know, where, by the way, where are you guys, uh, where are you calling from? Uh, we're actually in, located in the Angeles National Forest, which is kind of convenient during, really? I guess, the pandemic, yeah, but we're about oh about an hour, maybe an hour north of Hollywood? I you know, I'm very familiar with that area because years ago, a very good friend of mine, Michael Chill, had a, a sanctuary for wolves up there. Oh, yeah. And he, and I got to visit it, and I was absolutely, well, first of all, amazed at how beautiful these animals are. They are. And is, is, that so Shadow, I, I, is, is that Shadowland Foundation by chance? You know, it may have changed hands since when he started it, so I'm not sure what the current name may be. But I just know that I, I the animals they, they I got to actually go into a pen with one. Yeah. And he gave me a rake and he said, What I want you to do is if when you're walking, take the rake or, or a broom. It was a broom rather. And it just you know, like it's kinda like wiping your scent away right. from the ground. Right. <clears throat> but just magnificent animals. Yeah, I think it might be <clears throat> it might be Shadowland, which uh, so that you have an idea of where we are, we're actually about five minutes from the wolf sanctuary up here, and at, oh at night God. we can hear the wolves bay outside. So. Oh. <laughs> is, it, is it that that is a melody? Yeah, it's I amazing. Mean, if anybody has, has never heard the sound of the wolf howl, I mean, it's it's truly music. It is. Oh, my God. So, well, that is fantastic. I love that. And, and of course, when so, you were visiting the Wolves, you might have been wondering if maybe he would turn into Lon Chaney Jr. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had the pleasure of interviewing Ron not too long ago, yeah. um, you know, for my, my podcast. And uh, what a charming guy he is. I mean, he's been a friend of mine for years, but uh, we just... Uh, kind of got back together you know after that we're so involved you know with the families and stuff like that um but you will not find a more dedicated person to that legacy than ron cheney well there's that great and, connection uh, because your father and it was it his grandfather was lon cheney jr his grandfather was correct. yeah uh-huh and uh he's got he's, he's really i mean he and his whole family uh are so devoted to the legacy of the cheney dynasty and Ron, as I said, I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of meeting him, but he is just one of the most grounded, down-to-earth, sweetest human beings on the planet. Yeah. And uh, But my sister recalls the story, actually, when they were filming Abbott and Costello and Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And she said it was really kind of interesting to walk onto the soundstage, and here are all these monsters in their makeup from Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, uh, and they're all sitting in their, their chairs, smoking a cigarette, reading the paper, <laughs> this and that, you know, and she said that that just really got me, you know, she said like these monsters were just so normal. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Well, I guess you, you have something to be proud of, even though you were only like one year old to be on the set of uh, Abbott and Me Frankenstein. 
Were you not scared of Glenn Strange? Because he wanted to be Uncle Glenn, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, see, first of all, I have no recall of that moment. Uh, you know, I was just a year old. Um, but the story goes is that my mother brought me onto the set, and Glenn Strange, who played the Frankenstein monster, was he loved kids. So when he saw me coming onto the sound stage with my mother, he immediately got up, started walking towards me. <laughs> now in those elevated shoes, yeah. you know, right. the whole entire, you know, the monster makeup. With his arms outstretched saying, come to Uncle Glenn. <laughs> and at that point, I guess I just let it rip. You wow. know, it was a blood curdling scream <laughs> that could be heard, you know, two sound stages, you know, away. And Dad said, at that point, you know, just get her out of here. Get her yeah. out of here. <laughs> now, I guess you said you, you do know. have memories of being on the set of uh, Meet the Mummy. I do. Well, I was a little bit older, you know. But, it, again, you know, a, a kid's perception of something like that is so totally different, you know, from that of, let's say, a fan walking on the set yeah. or, you know, an adult walking on the set. So, you know, here you are, you know, I'm with my cousins and my dad and, you know, it to us, it was like, oh, we're going to see where Dad works. You know, we never <laughs> looked at him as sort of a star. It was like, this is what Dad does for a living. And so, you know, it. You know, I remember being on the set, and, you know, you were given the rules by Dad, Mom, whatever. Like, when you're on the set, you've got to be quiet, this, that, don't touch anything. And, uh, you know, I remember it as being very colorful. Uh, of course, the, the movie was shown in black and white, but it was a very colorful set. And the only thing I can remember as a kid was that I really did not want to see the mummy come around <laughs> yeah. the corner. Uh, that, that really, I was kind of like waiting for it, so I was kind of always kind of lingering back. Um, but that would probably be my one recall. It was just a very colorful set. They had broken for lunch or something, so it was it was a a, a bear set. And I'm, nobody was on on the sound stage, and uh, you know these. I think it was in the temple, mm -hmm. the temple scene, and I just thought, I know he's going to walk <laughs> around the corner. I do not want to see this man. Wow! So, but uh, we did meet him. You well, know, I we guess I, I saw the interview with you and your sister on stage uh, at the theater where they were showing uh, one of the films. And uh, uh -huh. she had said that, you know, the, the people, the crew, were all very, very kind that the uh, makeup artists used to put, like, scars on you guys and stuff just to show you what it was like. Well, and that so. was my two older sisters, correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's cool. They kind of had a family atmosphere around there, you know? Well, that was universal back in the day when, when it was uh, not what it is like today. Today, it's more of a corporation. Back yeah. then, it was, uh, you know, I, I, it was smaller. Yeah. Uh, even though, you know, you had the, the tower where the big wig sat and this and that. It was a little bit easier and friendlier, I think, than today, which is, as I said, it's more corporate-owned. Mm -hmm. um, but back then, my sister can recall, she and my other sister, Carol, who passed away in 87, um, going on the set and, you know, to kind of sidetrack them and occupy their time. The makeup men would take them out to the makeup trailer and put <laughs> makeup on them or scars on them and you know, then Patty recalls that uh, they'd even set up in the small theater where they would show the dailies. Mm -hmm. um, they would put on, you know, Johnny Mac Brown westerns and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember Bud Jr. telling me, and, and he was such a dear friend and what a gracious human being. You know, he, he just, he, he, uh, he found sort of like what I call the light in everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, never a mean word. I mean, he was just a spectacular human being. Um, but he can... Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> I got both sides. About, about oh, universal. He can, recall, yeah. he can recall that he had a squirt gun, mm -hmm. you know, and he said that I think it was on Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap with mm -hmm. Marjorie Main. Right. That he, he went onto the sound stage, and I guess his father had told him, but beforehand, please do not fork that 
pistol at anything that could cause, you know, an outage. Especially old Ma Kettle, well, Marjorie Maine. He, <laughs> he aimed it at one of the Klieg lights and ah. recorded it, and all of a sudden there was this tremendous pop. Yeah. You know, every it, it, it just blew the whole light out. And he said laughingly, he said, I ran so fast out of that sound stage because I knew I was going to get it. Yeah. But he said they finally brought me back and he said my dad just looked at me and he put his finger like up to my nose. He said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would imagine, I mean, I understand that Universal was a little bit different back then, but I would imagine that they probably treated your dad and Bud uh, a little bit better at least in the early days because it was really Abbott and Costello that blew Universal up to gigantic proportions yeah, right? if, if Shirley Temple saved Fox Abbott and Costello saved Universal mm-hmm. well that's true that's true but I, I you know I, I think that uh, they were kind of like their hands were tied because on one hand it was my dad was not afraid to go up to the, the, the powers to me and fight for the underdog. Right. I mean, that's what he was all about, you know. Um, and, in fact, uh, Maxine Andrews re- I, told me the story about when they were doing Buck Private. Mm-hmm. And she said that uh, Universal had totally lost faith in them. Uh, they they kind of just threw them into this Abbott and Costello vehicle. And she said, we were filming out on the back lot of Universal. It was the height of summer. She said it was very, very, very hot. And they brought in these canvas army tents which he said you can only imagine how hot that is you know and that that was supposed to be sort of our work trailer you know where we would change have the makeup this and that and my father got so outraged and he's very new to the lot but he was so outraged that he went up to um i guess we call it today the tower i don't know what they called it back then and he said if you want us to work he said, then you will bring proper trailers out for these girls. Exactly. And he was very adamant about it. And they did. They absolutely did. Because they knew he, was, he and Bud would not work unless the Andrews sisters got adequate, um, you know, trailers. Well, there was yeah. a lot of contract negotiations, too. I mean, didn't he have a lot of fights with Universal about money and salary? Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad was not afraid to bust them. You know, he knew that he was holding the winning card, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, like through the years, of course, you know, where uh, books have been written, this and that, he was really difficult and this and that. Well, he was to a point, but he was difficult because he was fighting, as I said, for the underdog. Right. right. I think that that's, um, I think that that's a, a miscommunication or a misinterpretation nowadays because we've talked to even like the grandchildren of uh, John Carradine and he was the same way like you had to have mm-hmm. proper you know the set had to be comfortable and as, as much as it could be or you know because other than that the conditions were just abhorrent and so there's a difference between being difficult and trying to actually just take care of your your co-workers um, well I, I agree with you. I totally, uh, totally agree with you. I think, you know, the press has a lot to do with building up the storyline, the copy line, uh, because, you know, a good copy is something that is going to make somebody want to purchase the newspaper. Right. Well, you know, back then it was no different. Um, it made more, it, I, to them, I think, more sense to say, well, Luke Costello was very difficult, or this and that. Uh, but they didn't get, they didn't peel away the layers to say what he was difficult about. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were looking at, at purely the press lead, you know, for something like that. Um, and both he and Bud, you know, I, I always say even to the hardcore fans that before Dad was a celebrity, he's a human being. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, there's peaks and valleys, you know, to all of us. Um, but for the most part, I would say they had, both men had a lot of goodness in their hearts. Uh, they fought for the underdog. They respected their co-stars. And even my father, and, you know, I mean, guys will be guys, and, of course, he could have a mouth on them. But when women were present, unlike what it is today, when women were present, he was always very respectful. Right. Now, I, I heard that uh, your your father really didn't like the universal Abbott Costello meet the monsters kind of thing. And he kind of felt like when they started having him do that, they were kind of turning on him. 
Well, that was basically Frankenstein. That wasn't all the monsters. That was Frankenstein. Oh, okay. And I think in his mind was, ah, all of a sudden now they've got Abbott and Costello meeting uh, uh, all these monsters in the film. So, you know, it, it really kind of upset him. And I think Bud went along with it, too, um, which was, why do you mean we can't carry this film, you know, anymore? You don't, you've lost that, that faith and that trust in us, but... We're not going to bring in the good returns at the box office. And I guess Universal saw it as a way of incorporating something new, a vehicle, you know, for them. Um, and, you know, as it turned out, it happened to become one of the most successful, you know, the cult classic, you mm -hmm. know, the Abbott and Costello film. Right. I, I guess at a screening, I think it was at the Frankenstein one. That your your grandmother had said to the producer that was oh, the best, yeah. and, and he got so mad at your grandmother for saying that was the best one. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's true. That's true. She went up to I think it was Robert Arthur. I think that's who the producer was. Uh huh. I made him mistake. At any rate, yeah, she did. She walked up to him and she said, "I just have to tell you, this is one of the best Abbott and Costello films I have ever seen." And my father was livid. <laughs> you know, and, uh, of course. He loved his mom so much. Yeah. I mean, he was an Italian boy, you know, and he loved his mom a lot. And I'm sure it just blew over, but he was a, a little pissed. Right. Well, there um, was one that he, wasn't... He, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, there was one that, that wasn't done that could have been and should have been, and the fans got all excited because on one of the Colgate comedy hours, they did a sketch where they meet the creature from the Black Lagoon. Now, from the Black Lagoon. Was, was there ever <laughs> any rumors that maybe they were going to do that as a film, but something happened, or do you know anything about that? I, you know, I really don't. And I'll tell you somebody who you should have on your show is Ron Palumbo. He is mm -hmm. the foremost authority on Abbott and Costello, author right. of Abbott and Costello in Hollywood. I mean, he's amazing. He is a walking encyclopedia. Um, I don't believe there was anything in the works about that, but probably they were testing the audience to see what the reaction would be with Abbott and Costello meeting the creature from the Black Lagoon. Right, right. Now, let's, uh, I wanted to, to talk about uh, your audiobook. Now, talk a little bit about Lose On First, because the original print of the book came out 40 years ago, right? Isn't that amazing? Oh, my God. That makes me feel so old. <laughs> it, it, it might be the longest uh, running print of a book ever. Yeah. I mean, usually books are not out there. You know, and I love you too for this. A lot of times, of course, you have the audio book that makes it all new. But you can't even get people to come on to talk about a book that was out 30, 40 years ago, whatever, you know. But but you're still promoting it. And it's great. But it's, it's legendary that your book's been out that long. And now it's on audio. Well, it, it, it came out, uh, the first publication, of course, was St. Martin's Press back in 1981, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it lasted 22 years in print. Wow. And it went into ebook about uh, three years ago uh, with uh, Crossroads Press. And then when COVID hit, it said... You know, maybe now is the time to do the audio book, because I have been talking about it, talking about it, and decided, you know, that now was the time, because, you know, I was I was at home. Um, and so I locked on to an excellent producer, Pamela Wise, mm -hmm. who has a long history in the film industry, and then also a wonderful sound engineer, editor, who's worked with the History Channel. Uh, June Miller up in, in San Francisco, JMC Sound. And we did this all via, you know, um, like a, an internal studio, you know, that could feed back into San Francisco. Wow. But what I wanted to do with the audio book, even though I'm the narrator on it, is I wanted to punch it up a little bit more by giving the sound bites. Mm, so, you know, when somebody, I, I start doing like who's on first, you know, I'll start repeating the words and then all of a sudden my voice fades and up comes Abbott and Costello. So it's giving them a little bit of Abbott and Costello, you know, within the actual audio book. And then, of course, what I did do is uh, at the end, added a bonus chapter, as many people throughout the years have always said, what happened to Mm -hmm. You know, following your mother's passing and this and that. So I said, okay, maybe now's the time to add the bonus chapter. 
which we did with sound bites. Um, I mean, I have to say I'm very proud of this. Um, it's been, oh, it took us, I'd say, six months from beginning to end and then into post-production for it. It is just absolutely amazing how it has taken off. And we're on all the major audiobook platforms, including Amazon, Audible. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very proud of it. I really am. And uh, soon to be coming out will be a, a, a special um, um, uh, offering of the CD version of the audiobook. Only 100 are being made up. Um, so we're going to be offering up that. Very cool. And if, if anybody wants to, you know, uh, get in touch with us, you can always um, write to me in here of Chris, um, C-H-R-A-S, C-O-8. 15 at AOL.com. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. I mean, when you did the uh, the audio version, was, was it like multiple takes or all in one take, or how was that done? Because I know oh, no, no. that can be it pretty was, difficult. There were a couple of chapters that were very difficult for me, even though I was not born at the time of my mother, my brother's passing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a little difficult, you know? So, yeah, there was, it was kind of like I had to disassociate myself emotionally from just seeing my family. Right. Um, in order for me to get through that chapter of tragedy, you know, with the loss of, of, of my brother. And, um, you know, so it was kind of, I was tricking my own emotional senses with it. Uh, same thing as when the passing of my dad, yeah. passing of my mother, um, you know, I realized that I, I, it, those are real emotional sequences in in my life you know so again as i said i had to really kind of do a number on myself yeah i can believe but that I had, had to be a, hard because we, we I, a, I really had a very patient producer yeah. and an extremely patient sound editor right um you know it was um um you know it worked out you know i'm very proud of the book of the audio book and i i hope people will hopefully you know uh check it out on on any of the, the you know platforms for audiobooks well you know i feel for you uh in, in getting through the tragic parts because we were watching again uh lou costello this is your life uh on uh, uh -huh. the ralph edwards show last night <laughs> on youtube and, and we felt so sorry for your dad because of course the, the drowning of your brother uh, was definitely a part of his life, but they kept dwelling on that. And there he was on camera. You could see his heart was breaking so bad, but he had to be professional and had to get through the show. Mm -hmm. That was so hard. And, and we were getting irritated at Ralph Edwards as he kept pushing yeah. it and dwelling on it. I don't know if you want a reaction or what, but but that that had to be hard. We saw you on the show. You yeah. were itty bitty. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> oh my God! I think I I rushed out on stage before they had a chance to announce me or something like that but wow but yeah you know a, a lot of people have, have said that you know about ralph edwards why did he have to do that this and that but the, but then again that was the show this yeah. is your life how could you not put that segment in um i think it was awful for my parents because both my mother you know and my father that was their child yeah. that they lost and my mother kind of gets glossed over but as I re remind so many of the fans, I said, yes, my dad did lose his son, but so did my mother. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, you know, it was it was a tough time. All you had to do was, you know, register the expression on their faces, which I'm sure you did, having just watched yeah. it last night. You know, it's, it's a tough one. I think for any parent, regardless of whether you're a celebrity or not, no parent should ever have to outlive a child. Right. Um, you know, it's uh, no. And, so, and you know, if that and, wasn't and there, hard enough, too. Okay, yeah. there was the. I want to know about your reaction when you saw the the movie they made with Harvey Corman and Buddy Hackett, and they, of <laughs> course, showed that with the drowning of your brother in that too. How was that for you to watch that? Well, to be honest with you, I haven't watched it since it first aired. Um, I I was appalled. Yeah. I was, um, there was, if the whole thing was just blatant inaccuracy after inaccuracy after inaccuracy, um, I fault, seriously, the manager, Eddie Sherman, who um, did this project, you know, the book first with Bob Thomas. I think, um, you know, he 
sustain that such friendship, you know, to my dad and to Bud. And then to wait until after my father is gone to kick him in the gut and slap him in the face like right. this was a real eye opener to me in Hollywood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad used to say he loved the art. He did not like the business, you know, of Hollywood. Um, but that's, that's what happened. You know, people are idolized when they're alive. Robin Williams, great taste. Yeah. Or, or, you know, stories. You know, the man was idolized. You know, he was revered. The man passes away, and I said to a friend, watch. Give it a couple of weeks. Give it three weeks. Watch what happens on the newsstands. And sure enough, you know, I was in the market one day, and I was in the checkout line. I happened to turn around right there in a rag magazine. Biggest, boldest headline. Robin Williams OD'd on drugs and hung himself. Mm. Right. And I looked at that, and I just shook my head, and I said, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. So to me, it was like the best way I could. See, backing up just a minute, my sister Carol, she was on the phone with Bob Thomas, the author, when the book was released. Um, And uh, she kept saying to him, how could you write such blatant lies and untruths about him? Mm. And he said, well, unfortunately, Carol, you don't sell a book by being nice. Well, I have to walk in on that conversation and I thought to myself well I bet you can sell a book by being fair right and that's what I did so what I did is I took four years and I canvassed everybody I could you know now this was at a time before computers and Mm -hmm. Google and yes all of this stuff so it was letter writing it was cold calling it was trying to get with everybody and anybody It, it was the person that hammered the nail into the set to the makeup people, to the producers, the directors, the co-stars, the stars, the friends, boyhood friends, business associates, people that knew him. Because what I was going to do, was it, it, it was not my book. I couldn't write the book. I was too young. But they could write the story for me. Right. And that's what I did. You know, is I wanted the interviews in the book um, as told to me by the people that knew him. My book lasted 22 years in print. The Bob Thomas Eddie Sherman book lasted one printing. And, and you know, you, you can get back at those people that made that bad Abbott Costello movie by putting your own movie out of your book. That could happen. <laughs> and it'd be you total know, revenge. Anything, is, po- <laughs> anything <laughs> is possible. But I'll tell you, anybody who knows me knows that I'm going to be a real hard sell on that. Because I'll tell you why. In the past, we have had people approach us wanting to do the life story. And Every script I have read, it goes right back into people retrieving from that Bud and Lou mm. yeah. book and reincorporating it into their project. I had one producer, this is kind of funny actually, who was trying to secure a deal through Mandalay Bay. Mm. and um, Or Mandalay. And um, we were reading the script before the meeting and I called my sister and I said Patty have you read the script and she said I, I haven't finished it and I said well this is gonna this, this is funny I said interesting how I'm not even born <laughs> and okay. she said what <laughs> she said no I'm not even born so I called George Page the producer and I said George I've just got one problem with this script I said <laughs> You've got everything written in here, but I'm not even born. And he said, well, he hemmed and hawed and said, well, well we're going to have your mom pregnant at the time of your father's death. And I said, George, that's not No, that true. didn't not happen true. that way. It never happened no, that way. You, you were like, what, 11 years old when your dad died? Yeah, yes. And I said, so, here's, here, you know, and then they, they had things in there that were so... You know, like one of the people that uh, worked for us, Ophelia, God bless her, she was a member of the family. And they they were using her almost as, as the protagonist, you know, in this thing. And I said, no. I said, I would never do that to, to that woman or her family. Yeah. She was a cherished, loving member of our family. So when people say, do you think you would ever, ever consider doing a movie of the week again on Earth? doing a movie of the week based on your book I would say I'm never going to close the door on anything but I will tell you right now I have very little faith in Hollywood mm-hmm. right. um, it's, it's all about 
the box office receipts. It's about the money in the pocket. How much can I take to the bank? Well, we can't take it to the bank unless we, you know, punch up here, punch up there. And so to me, I would rather let it rest. You know, to, to, to me, to be honest with you, I love my father, my family so much that I don't care if somebody offered me $2 million. Yeah, I don't care if they offered me $3 million in cold, hard cash. I would turn it down. Good for you. Because that's how much I love them. Yeah. So there's not any amount of money on this planet that would ever, ever make me um, uh, take down their memory and what they did do and take down the reality and the truth right. to spin a whole other story. It's not worth it. You know, so, you know, it's, it's just do, I mean, when I'm long gone, Okay, when I'm long gone, my great niece Victoria Marshall will have the total rights to um, the book, and she is a real on top of it, a uh, uh, 22, 23 year old who is in the process of getting her um, bachelor's mm-hmm. in in film. Um, and I, I said, you know, Tori, I know if anybody can uphold the legacy of this family and your grandfather, you're going to be the one. You know, and so I left it to her. I said, you know, in my will, it goes to you. Now, your you know, your you sister, your sister's still with us, right? Absolutely. Good, fantastic. How's she doing? She's doing great. And here's a woman who is um, 83 years old. This woman walks four to five miles a day. <laughs> oh my god! Okay. I mean, she could run rings around any 22 year old. Seriously, I'm no. not kidding you. And, uh, no, but she's doing great. She really is. She takes excellent care of herself. And she's got a fun personality. Um, you know, she's got a lot of grandkids, a lot of greats. And uh, she's just enjoying life. And, and she, enjoying, she's you know, on board with you in protecting your father's legacy, too, right? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, it, it's just, you know, there's always the seedy part of any business. And that happens to be the seedy part of Hollywood. Right. right. You know, it's... Well, um, you know, and, and so it, it, it's like, you know, I commend anybody, anybody who can go to bat for their loved one because their voices are no longer able to be heard. Right. So right. we become their voices. And hopefully there are many voices behind us. You know, when we're gone, that will pick up. Well, you know. I, I think it's great uh, that, that you and the family are so staunch with protecting and preserving uh, the legacy uh, of your dad and, and, and Bud. Uh, but what I wanted to ask is, what are the reactions that you get and kind of the, the I guess, uh, demographic of fans that you hear from? Because, you know, it, Abbott and Costello's uh, pinnacle was a while ago. And I know that there is still a huge amount of diehard fans, but are you seeing that new generations are coming into the fold? Because I'll I'll tell you, Chris, my concern is we'll sit down and we'll watch comedy nowadays, and for lack of a better word, it sucks, okay? And you sit down and and you you watch Abbott and Costello, or you watch Laurel and Hardy, or you watch The Three Stooges, or you watch Martin and Lewis, and it's it's it holds up and it feels good, but my concern is that the new generations aren't going to find them. Well, for, let me tell you this: for instance, you know, I'm a big Laurel and Hardy fan as well as a fan of your father and his his partner. Mm-hmm. But I have a, a ceramic Laurel and Hardy setting on my fireplace mantle, a big, tall, painted back in the day we used to paint the uh, plaster statues. And that's go. And that's go. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And my Enesco daughter's statues. my daughter's friend came over and looked at him, and she looked at Ollie. And she said, why do you have a statue of Hitler? Oh, yeah. Adolf Hitler, <laughs> really? Because the younger generation may not know. And, 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 you know, that's why I'm glad you're around to still teach oh. them and, and to, you know, involve them. But, but going back to Tiffany's question. Yeah. Do you, do you see that new factions, new generations are being brought into the, the fan fold, if you will, of Abbott and Costello? I, I do. I do. Now, now we've got on Facebook, we've got four or five groups, um, that are well beyond 5,000, uh, lim- you know, the, the capacity. Um, we've got probably over 40,000, you know, in all the groups combined and still growing. 
Uh, we've got a lot of young people that will come on and say, "My, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm from wherever they are. I'm 23 years old or I was just a teenager when my father introduced me to the comedy of mm-hmm. your dad and Mr. Abbott. Yeah. It, it's a shirt sleeve effect. I think that um, a younger generation, I think, first of all, it's, it's getting past it. A lot of them don't want to watch black and white. Yeah. But then you have to realize, too, that they have been, they were born into color. Right. You know, so to me, it's that the black and white is an art form. You know, when people say, well, why can't they colorize it for a younger generation? Because they were filmed for black and white. They weren't filmed for color. Now you've got somebody establishing what color would that dress be? What color would the jacket be? Right. Maybe it was not the color that the costume designer envisioned at the time. So then you're taking away and stripping away the talent of all those people that worked on that film. So I'm not a person that really says you have to colorize something to bring a younger generation into it. I think if the younger generation is not going to appreciate it because it's in black and white. They're not going to appreciate the comedy in general. Right. They're not going to appreciate, you know, anything that, that is part of that film, makeup. Um, we have a newsletter that we put out, and if you guys would like to be on it, just send email me your, your email addresses, and I'll get you on. Mm-hmm. Um, we it, It's an Abbott and Costello newsletter letter that comes out uh, once a month on the 1st. We have got people, over 4,000 members, we're 12 years strong, and we're, we're, we're gaining speed every single week. But we've got people that are from South America. Oh, of course. We've got from all Europe, right. Australia, uh, Israel. Uh, we've even got some from the Middle East that are part of the newsletter. And, um, you know, we're uh, it's a team effort. Ron Palumbo is on board with us to help field the questions, answer the questions. We've got Jeff Salimondo, who puts together a spectacular memories and milestones to coordinate with the month. And then we've got Karen Cucho, or Winterfield Cucho, who does lose Patterson. You know, so everything that's going on in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, we have Joe Savoya, who does a trivia, which is, I mean, people love the trivia. So it, it's gaining a lot of speed, and we find that a lot of younger people are asking to be put on the subscriber list. So yeah. I think it's just a matter of, you know, people just, you know, it, 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 it's the father passing it to the son or the grandfather to the, the grandson. But I don't think they will ever, ever die. And that means Laurel and Hardy and all the greats. Right. Yeah, and, you're and, you're and like us, Chris. Yes, you're fighting the fight to uh, stop cancel culture because <laughs> people are wanting to forget exactly. the past. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's to me, and I always say this to everybody when they say, well, I like Laurel and Hardy more than Abbott and Costello, or I like Abbott and Costello more than Laurel and Hardy. And we had this big thing going on on Facebook, and I said, wait a minute. <laughs> can't you like them all? Yeah, no, I like them all. You can't like them all? And in fact, I you're... I if you realize, well, they all gave something unique and different. Right. Yeah. It's like comparing apples to oranges, you know. And so I, I would say to somebody, I said, look, you know, it, it's a personal preference. I don't, I'm not insulted if somebody said, well, I prefer, I love Abbott and Costello, but I really love Laurel and Hardy. I think good for you. I admire them, too. Good for you. you Laurel know? and Hardy gave my dad a break when he was an extra in one of their shorts <laughs> in the Battle of the Century, okay? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, so, I, it, to me, it's, it, it's just got to cut some flat. You know, well, there's and, room for uh, everybody. And like I said, just remind them exactly. of that. Like, for instance, Joe Besser, who was one of the three stooges at the end, okay, wound up being in your dad's TV show. And, of he course... Was a dear, he was a dear man. Oh, okay. you know, Joe Besser was a great. I, I don't think he gets enough credit. He, he was a dear man. He really was. He lived just uh, not even five minutes from me. Wow. Wow. Mm. Yeah. That's incredible. Now I want to find out because your your dad and and his partner uh, Bud traded off on the Colgate Comedy Hour with Martin and Lewis. Uh, what kind of a friendship did they have with Martin and Lewis? What did they think of them? Was was there a rivalry or friendship? Well, I think it, it was it was not rivalry. Seriously, Dad and Bud 
appreciated the comedy of every team, every solo artist. Um, they were very much in support of their peers. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not like it is today. Believe me. Um, they, they respected Martin and Lewis. You know, I mean, Martin and Lewis was the last, really, of the great comedy team. Yeah. You know, when you think of it. Um, you know, people love to bring up <laughs> poor Dean Martin in his nose. And, you know, like, did your dad pay for his, his getting his nose done and this and that? And I go, I have never seen so much attention <laughs> on one person's nose. Your, you know, your, your, your dad God. paid for the operation for Dean's nose or something like that? He evidently paid for <laughs> Dean Martin's nose. Okay. <laughs> and, that, you know, and I thought, oh, my God, here we go again. Every time I see that question listed on Facebook, I go, here we go again. <laughs> I tell you what, you guys you guys wrestle this one out going and, uh, you know, having a cup of coffee, but... Um, no, they, they, there was no animosity whatsoever. They appreciated, you know, the genius that, and the chemistry that they had. Again, apples and oranges. And well, see, what, you people, know, you can't, what people don't understand is it wasn't a big deal about the Dean Martin nose thing because your dad paid for a lot of things health-wise, oh, surgery-wise yeah. for other people. Like, he was very, very ph- philanthropic. Did a lot of things for kids and, and people in hospitals and the whole thing. I mean, well, always helping. It, kids. Kids was was his center. That's that's you know, Dad. When you know, he he grew up in a very you know middle class you know family. He, they weren't wealthy. And when he started to make the money, there was an old expression called he had long arms, short pockets. Mm-hmm. And for him, it was to help others. Um, you know, when when my brother died, the way that I think it. He helped ease his grief. Was he built the youth center for the underprivileged kids in East LA, which is still going on to this day? Yeah, I, 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 um, I was wow, it's still going on. That's it, incredible. Well, the city has taken it over, but it's still going on. It still bears my brother's name. And you know, with Dad, it was that it was important that the center be built in a place that was not affluent. Yeah. Um, he wanted. He, he said, "I want the dirtiest, the roughest area in L.A. I want it where the kids need it the most, and that's what he did." You know, and as a result, it's it, it's situated in in the Boyle Heights district. You know, uh, surrounded by the projects. Um, that, but that's what he wanted. He wanted to give these kids a chance. Wow. Well, I've got to ask you because there's one story I'd like to have you tell. You had a lot of celebrity friends. Of course, he was really good friends with Charlie Chaplin because they bring up, you know, the old comedy classics and this and that. But he had a problem, I believe it was with Errol Flynn and some naughty movie. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, what happened there? Well, as my sister would say, Uncle Errol got, <laughs> you know, 86 from the house. <laughs> Errol Flynn was a prankster. You know, he was just simply a prankster. Um, and evidently what happened is it was on one of my sister's birthdays. It may have been Patty. Um, we had a, a home theater there and it was customary for, you know, stars of that, that era to loan out each other's films and this and that. Now we're talking about and real film, that, like, like we're real, about real, the, the kind where you thread the machine yes. type of film. I have to say that because people nowadays, they don't know what a record is. They don't know what a film is. <laughs> Oh, my God. They miss out on so much. Yes. yes, yes. But as my sister would say, she said, you have to envision, here was in this, this theater, the, the creme de la creme, upper echelon of your Hollywood, you know, royalty, per mm-hmm. say. The kid sitting here watching, and um, Errol Flynn brought, was to bring over a swashbuckling film, one of his films. And so Dad threads the reel. And um, he started it, walked out of the theater, and he's at the bar that we had in our home, and he's talking to Errol. Now, my dad did not drink except maybe one drink during the holidays, because one drink for him was like five drinks, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he was at the bar, and Errol was having a drink, and he, he, he said, this is weird. 
there's not a sound coming out of that theater. And it's a swashbuckling. Well, no, none of them were. Well, he got up. Yeah, he uh, walked, you know, over to where the theater was. He opened the door. He turned and looked at the screen, and Patty said it was like his head was just shaking. He almost, like, bit the cigar in half, screaming, don't look, don't look, close your eyes, don't look. Try to get up to the, the uh, projector to turn it off. I take it it well, was a naughty man, film. It was a naughty film? He brought a sad film. Oh, oh my He God. brought a sad film. <laughs> So Errol was 86 from the house for a while. <laughs> Is it true that your your dad decked him? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so he expected to see Probably. he expected to see Robin Hood or something, and it didn't turn out to be. What yeah, he, yeah. He saw stars instead. But uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that I wanted is so funny. I wanted to ask you about uh, your podcast. To tell our listeners a little bit about it, Chris on Q. I'm sure everybody automatically assumes it's going to be Chris all Costello Abbott and Costello is going to do it's all Abbott and Costello podcast, but it's not. Tell no. our, tell our listeners no, a little no, no, bit no, no, about no. your show. It does cross paths because you did have a Cheney on, and you had Kate Smith on, who gave them their break, Thank and they were on her radio show. But. Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, when it, when I launched the idea for the On Cue Chris Costello, what I was trying to do is to give, again, a voice to those people that are crashing the ceiling, you know, whether it's a male or a female, regardless. Mm-hmm. And people that may not have their voices heard, um, and we have had some powerful guests on, people that have crashed the ceiling, people that have been heard, uh, everybody from uh, Francis Gary Powers, Jr., to Sergei Khrushchev, the son of, of, of Nikolai Khrushchev. Right. Wow. Um, uh, you know, we have had uh, um, Elizabeth Faisal, an Olympian, concert violinist, uh, even uh, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nicola Polidor, who mm. was the first female to fly a, um, I think it's a stealth bomber, right. uh, over the Roseville Parade of 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and, and then just recently, of course, we did Ron Cheney, and then we just did a beautiful piece on the iconic Kate Smith, who, of course, gave Chad and Bud, they're launching Chad into Hollywood, right? Um, and uh, interviewed her niece, and uh, her niece's husband, Bob Andron, Susie and Bob Andron. Very proud of it. I really enjoy it, but what we're, we're doing is putting a little bit more of the sound bites into it. Um, we incorporate the music, but we're trying to bring sort of a visual, right. you know, into the audio. Um, and uh, have you listened to the Kate Smith one? I'm so proud of that. I'm going to definitely, because Kate Smith was, was such a great talent and a big star of the day, for sure. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. You know, every time I play that woman's song, God Bless America, yeah. it just puts chills through me. Absolutely. So, oh. Uh, but you guys are wonderful, and um, uh, you know it's it's certainly been a pleasure. You know, I love talking with both of you. Absolutely, I want to tell all of our listeners get get a piece of paper out right now or type it down if you haven't visited it yet. You can uh, check out uh, on Q with Chris Costello at Chris on Q dot Buzzsprout dot com. So that's Chris on Q C H R I S on C U E dot buzzsprout.com and then of course if listeners haven't already checked it out I don't know if they've been living under a rock or whatever but there is <laughs> Abbott and Costello Collectibles dot com and make sure to spell out and A N D it's not the ampersand so it's Abbott and Costello Collectibles dot com. Uh Chris it's been such a pleasure to have you on and oh, an you honor. Are so sweet. No, I got I just got one question for you guys. Sure. What's that? Do you get up do you get off do you get off the mountain? Uh, not as much anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I used to I used to like you know a couple times a week, but uh, ever since the quarantine, I think uh, yeah, ever since the quarantine, I go off the mountain maybe once every three to four months, and it's just to get supplies, and then it's back oh to back to country living. So. I, re- I, okay, refuse. I, tell you, I tell you what, I tell you what. Okay, hmm. once COVID is over with, and. People, you know, are free to roam about the cabin uh-huh. or the country. Um, you know, if you guys ever get into Burbank or LA, let me know, and uh, I'd love to sit down with you. Uh, buy you lunch. 
Oh, Fantastic. And, and equally, wonderful I'm, to talk to. I would equally love to have you come up here to Lake Hughes and, and come into the studio and do a show like in person on camera. I mean, that would be awesome. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that means I have to go into full makeup now. <laughs> <laughs> God, it is such an honor okay. talking to you, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you look as good as you sound because you you. Oh, you are so sweet. You are a delight. You are a delight. Wow. Well, you are so sweet. You guys are amazing. I've had such good time, um, and you know, do keep in touch. Yeah. And again, if anybody has any questions, and and certainly, please give me your email. I'll put you on our mailing list for sure. Yes, yes, for sure. And and you're really good about autographing stuff, too, like the stuff you saw on the website and that. I I know uh, uh, Bud Jr. used to, but of course he's gone now, but... uh, but only had the one kid, or did did he? Was it? no? There, there is also a daughter. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Vicky. Mm-hmm. You know, I but I was the closest, I guess, to Bud because we didn't live that far away from each other. Yeah. Right. Um, just a real, real super, super nice guy who, um, just as I said, there was not a bean bone in this guy's yeah. body. Well, I of course love Universal, but I, I really wish they would pay homage to your father's legacy more like for instance they they have an award every year called the Igor Award because they have their Universal Horror Nights and your father and 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 Bud contributed so much to that they really should give you the Igor Award I don't know why they don't uh, well you know what's interesting is is you have to look at who is sitting up there you know uh, these are people that probably don't even know who Abbott and Costello is yeah you know seriously and why Um, why Oliver Hardy has a mustache and looks like Hitler these little people that (laughs) exactly exactly it's like it's like years ago a friend of mine went to an audition and uh, um, remember the the woman? Um, oh God, was it Jan Clayton who was the mother in Laffey? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. At any rate, I mean, she came off of Broadway, this and that. She had credit the length of your arm, and she went up for an audition at Universal. And the casting director wanted to know what she had done. Oh my God! And I thought. Oh my God! Wow. So well, you know that probably answers the question. You know, Chris. Unfortunately, it's just a byproduct of 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 the culture nowadays. Because I remember going back to what Terry was saying about the Universal Igor Awards. We were there. This was probably about a decade ago. We were there covering the event as press, and I was standing along the red carpet next to a young reporter. I won't say what outlet she was from. I will. is from E! E! Entertainment. <laughs> but okay. uh, they had uh, Christopher Lloyd coming down the red carpet and she looked at her, her, her other young reporter next to her and goes, who is that? And I was like, are you... What that wasn't even that long ago? Are you serious? Oh, <laughs> well, the, that's so you know that just pains me. Yeah. It really just pains me. The coolest thing I saw oh, in my God. notes is that uh, at one time. Uh, your dad was offered to buy Universal. I wish I wished he would have. Yeah, because that <laughs> would have been that would have been so cool. Because, you know, well, Universal and them. I mean, there was a respect, but there was also kind of a love hate relationship, if you will, because they really didn't was. treat him good enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it it was, and also you know, Universal back then was a B studio. It was yeah. the studio that the Louis B. Mayers used to threaten to send their Clark Gable to when they got out of one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. Right. Okay. All right. You well, have we a good will night. we will definitely keep in touch, Chris. And again, thank you so Beautiful. much. Thank you so much for the uh, interview. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the time with you. All right. Thank you. Have a great rest of your weekend. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.